Hello, everyone. I think we should start probably. Um, it's it's two minutes past five. So um, welcome to our short talk on the Merricks and MasterCard Supreme Court judgment. Um, I say short because we're very conscious that it's the Thursday before Christmas and that everyone has probably got lots of things that they want to be getting on with. And um, we see really the purpose of this as giving you a summary really of the key findings in the Supreme Court's judgment and um, Victoria will then um, for her part explain what the judgment might mean for the collective actions regime going forward um, and, and obviously we hope that uh, and I think probably whichever side of the argument you normally represent lawyers generally hope because it's good for business that this judgment will kick start the collective actions regime going forward, because it's certainly true to say that having having been it having been instituted, the regime has really been asleep and nothing much has happened. And so we anticipate that quite apart from anything else, um, this will shine a green light for collective actions going forward and the regime will now be used. Um, but Victoria will talk about that in a little bit more detail. What I want to do is really summarise the key findings of the Supreme Court judgment, or should I, say, I should say judgments. Now, um, I'm sure most people listening will know uh, the broad details about the case. So this, this proposed collective action um, is very large scale. Um, Mr Merricks, who is the representative of the, of the proposed collective proceedings, um, proposes to represent all UK, all UK resident adult consumers of goods and services purchased in the UK during a 16 year period. And the 16 year period is the 16 years um, over which the European Commission established that MasterCard's multilateral exchange fees infringed competition law. Um, and so it's an ambitious claim. It's a big claim. And it's the kind of claim that really can only be brought in collective proceedings as a matter of practicality, um, because um, what each individual consumer is set to recover by way of damages is really um, insufficient by and large to justify the cost of expensive and complicated proceedings such as these. So one might have thought that it's the paradigm case or a paradigm case for using the new collective actions regime. And what the Supreme Court judgment was all about uh, was the certification criteria uh, for collective actions, because um, I'm sure that, that, that most of you will know that you can't just proceed with a collective action as of right. Um, the Competition Appeal Tribunal has to certify it as, as being suitable for going forward. Um, and this this, this um, case really focused on um, one of the eligibility criteria. So section 47B subsection 5 of the Competition Act says that the CAT may make a collective proceedings order only in respect of claims which are eligible for inclusion in collective proceedings. Now the other, the other main um, condition that has to be satisfied is that the representative has to be suitable. And there wasn't any dispute about that um, in this case. So the CAT found that the representative, Mr. Merricks, was suitable. And the debate focused on whether the claims were eligible to, for inclusion in collective proceedings. And what, what subsection six of the same section in the Act says is that claims are only eligible if the CAT considers that they raise the same, similar or related issues of fact or law and are suitable to be brought in collective proceedings. So there's, there's this, um, there are two elements to that. The first is that there are common, similar or related issues of fact and law. And the second, it's a separate requ requirement, is that they're suitable to be brought in collective proceedings. And it's the, the question of suitability that was at stake in, in, in the appeal. Now, what happens is that the, the Act doesn't say very much about what's meant by suitable. In fact, it doesn't say anything. Um, but that criterion, that condition, is then addressed in the tribunal rules. And the relevant rule here is Rule 79. And what that says, Rule 79.2, says that in determining whether claims are suitable, the tribunal, the CAT, shall take into account all matters that it thinks fit 
including a list of factors which are then enumerated in Rule 79.2. And this case focused on factor F, which is whether the claims are suitable for an aggregate award of damages. And um, an aggregate award of damages is something which is contemplated by Section 47C of the Act. And what that says is that the tribunal may make an award of damages without undertaking an assessment of damages recoverable by each individual in the class. And that's a really important innovation because what it means is that un, un, by contrast to the normal principle of tortious um, compensation, the tribunal doesn't have to look at every member of the class and individually add up um, what each person has suffered by way of loss. Um, so that but 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 can start um, instead from the top. So can look at what did the class, um, what loss did the class suffer, and make an aggregate award without individually assessing each individual member of the class's loss. So it's top down. It permits a top down assessment of damages rather than a bottom up assessment of damages, which in some cases, um, including this case, might be much more manageable. Now, the Competition Appeal Tribunal in this case refused certification on the basis that the claims were not suitable for inclusion in collective proceedings, and it had two reasons for that. The first reason was that it held that, that, that the claims were not suitable for an aggregate award of damages because it would be very difficult to prove pass-through from retailers to the class. And so what that argument focused on, and we, all, we, we accept, so we acting for Mr Merrick's um, on behalf of the class, accept that to show that the class has suffered damage, we'll need to show that the, um, that, that the, the fees that were paid um, that, that caused retailers to uh, bear more of a burden, that they pass that burden on to consumers that, that purchase goods, and, goods or services from them. And MasterCard were saying in this, well, you won't be able to, we won't, you won't be able to prove that um, because in particular, um, pass on rates differ uh, significantly between different sections of, uh, of retail, of goods and services, um, different sectors of the economy, and also might differ over time. And you've got a very large claim over a very protracted period of time. And so you can't possibly get the data to prove that that pass through has happened or to what extent it's happened. The second reason that the CAT refused certification was that Mr. Merrick's distribution proposal. So how would he distribute any award of damages at the end of the proceedings? The CAT said that didn't correspond to the compensatory principle because what Mr Merrick's proposed was that essentially it would be done on a per capita annualised basis. So you would have to show as a member of the class for how many years you were in, in, in the, the, the um, class. So which of the 16 years were you a consumer of goods and services in the UK? But once you demonstrated that, essentially it would be that the award would be divided up on a per capita basis and without... Um, reference to the different spending patterns um, between of, of different individuals in the class, which might, of course, vary considerably. Now, in relation to the first point, the pass-through point, the Competition Appeal Tribunal held that the expert evidence adduced by Mr Merricks at the certification hearing had not demonstrated a sufficient likelihood of there being available at trial sufficient data for all sectors across the whole of the infringement period. And this focus on sufficient data was drawn from, from Canadian case law, in particular, the Supreme Court judgment, um, the, the Canadian Supreme Court judgment in uh, Microsoft and ProSys. Now, in relation to the second point, um, the CAT held that the per capita distribution on an annualised basis was not, was not sufficiently individually compensatory and therefore didn't, uh, didn't meet the, the condition that tort claims um, compensate individuals for their loss. Now, the Supreme Court was unanimous on the second issue, the distribution issue, and they found in our favour unanimously on that point. So all of them agreed that the tribunal had made an error in refusing certification on the basis that the proposed distribution method wasn't sufficiently compensatory. And what the court held was that the compensatory principle is not essential in the distribution of an aggregate award. So all that needs to happen at that stage um, is that the distribution um, proposal, which is, which, which is um, 
there's then a hearing on, on, on it usually on, on what the proposal, whether the proposal is fair and reasonable. Um, it, it simply needs to be fair and reasonable. It doesn't need to comply with the compensatory principle at the individual level um, at the distribution stage. And indeed, the court said that the very innovation of Section 47C, which introduces the aggregate award of damages, is to radically alter, and those are the court's words, the, comp the common law compensatory principle by removing the need to assess individual loss. And they said that nothing in the Act and nothing in the rules reimposes that um, individual uh, individual compensatory principle again at the distribution stage because that would undermine the innovation that has been made by section 47c. So the court was in agreement on that point but um, we had to succeed on both points um, because the CAT had, had held that both of these reasons were self-standing reasons for refusing certification. And on the first issue, the pass-through issue, whether the claims were suitable for an aggregate award of damages, the court was divided. Now, Lord Briggs gave judgment for the majority in our favour. Um, now, the, he, what he said was that the reason given by the CAT for refusing certification related essentially to the difficulty in quantifying damages, in quantifying pass-through. And he said that English courts don't, don't deprive claimants of a trial when they can show they've got an arguable case, when they've shown that they've got a a case which is otherwise arguable on the merits. The English courts don't deprive claimants of a trial merely because of forensic difficulties in quantifying damages. Um, they'll do their best. And Lord Briggs said that may they may have to resort to educated guesswork or estimation. And he referred to the well-known broad acts principle in quantifying damages. Um, and he also said that the difficulties that the CAT had identified in quantifying damages would have equally been present for an individual claim as well. So the fact that the claims were being grouped in collective proceedings didn't make it more difficult to quantify damages because the same difficulties would have been present if an individual member of the class had pursued an individual claim. And he said further that certification doesn't involve a merits test. So the role of the tribunal at the certification stage is not to consider how strong the claim is on the merits, because the CAT has got a separate power to strike out a claim that's not strong or to grant summary judgment. And, uh, and those are the powers that, that if a defendant thinks a claim uh, isn't sufficiently strong on the merit, they can apply for, to strike out the claim or for summary judgment. And the CAT has got a discretion to list that at the same time as the certification hearing. But if that's not the case, then the certification hearing should not concern the substantive merit, merits of the case. So what does, Lord Briggs asked, what does suitable to be included in collective proceedings mean? Does it mean suitable in the abstract? Does it mean these are suitable proceedings to bring because um, they may be easy to prove or because they're, they're, they're they're pursuing something valuable or, or anything like that? Or does it mean suitable as compared with individual proceedings? And Lord Briggs held that it means the second of those things. So it's a comparative exercise that the court, that the tribunal is focusing on when looking at suitability. Um, so it's, it's asking itself, are these claims suitable to be included in collective proceedings? as compared with um, proceeding on an individual basis. And that's the comparative question that the tribunal needs to address. And Lord Briggs held that this was one of the key errors made by the Competition Appeal Tribunal in this case, because it, what it failed to do was to construe suitability in the Act in this relative sense. And, uh, and Lord Briggs said that if those difficulties would have been the difficulties that the CAT had identified in quantifying damage and assessing pass-through, if they would have been insufficient to deny an individual claimant a trial, which he, he said they would have been because there was no suggestion of strikeout here, and, uh, and also that the court's equipped um, with, with the broad acts principle and has to make the best of whatever evidence is adduced, then they shouldn't in principle have defeated certification. Um, Lord Briggs also said that the tribunal had, had, had made various other errors, including treating suitability for an aggregate award of damages, which is 
the, 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 the factor F in the factors in Rule 79.2 as being a hurdle rather than simply one of, of many factors that need to be weighed in the balance. Uh, and also held that the most serious of the errors made by the CAT was that it didn't take into account the general principle that the court must do what it can with evidence available when quantifying damages. Uh, and, and in relation to that, the court, Ms. Lord Briggs held at paragraph 73, and I'm going to read it out. Um, the fact that data is likely to turn out to be incomplete and difficult to interpret, and that its assembly may involve burdensome and expensive processes of disclosure, are not good reasons for a court or tribunal refusing a trial to an individual or to a large class who have a reasonable prospect of showing they've suffered some loss from an already established breach of statutory duty. In the context of suitability for collective proceedings or aggregate damages, it's no answer to say that members of the class can bring individual claims. They would face the same forensic difficulties in establishing merchant pass on and insuperable funding obstacles on their own litigating for small sums for which the, the cost of recovery would be disproportionately large. Um, now, uh, you can see just from that paragraph that I've read out that Lord Briggs um, appears to have been intensely aware that the purpose of the regime is to render effective the, the compensation for competition breaches in circumstances where it simply may not be practicable at all for individuals who have suffered loss to bring their own claims. And he had that well in mind when interpreting the act. Now, Lord Sales and Lord Leggett reached a different conclusion on the pass on issue, and they would have allowed MasterCard's appeal. They essentially considered that the tribunal's assessment that the claims were not suitable for an aggregate award of damages was lawful. And the main difference between the, um, the, 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 the minority and the majority is that Lord Sales and Lord Leggett disagreed with Lord Briggs and the majority on the meaning to be given to suitable. So Lord Sales and Lord Leggett said that suitable means suitable to be grouped together, yes, but this includes, it's not a purely relative analysis, it includes consideration of whether the collective proceedings offer a reasonable prospect of achieving a just outcome. And they said that Lord Briggs' approach, that the suitability requirement is relative and solely a question of whether the proceedings are suitable to be brought in collective proceedings rather than individual proceedings, they said that that, that approach would very significantly diminish the role and utility of the certification safeguard. So two very different views. And um, they also held that, that the question of whether, the, the, the point F question of whether or not proceedings are suitable for an aggregate award of damages um, calls for an assessment of whether there's likely to be a method available which can be used to assess loss suffered by the class as a whole with a reasonable degree of accuracy. And they said that yes, the court will have regard to the broad acts principle, but at the same time, they were, they were acutely aware that, um, that, that the collective actions regime confers advantages on claimants and, and defendants mustn't be unduly disadvantaged. And they said that, that justice is to a defendant means that it shouldn't be ordered to pay damages which are not based on a reasonable estimate of loss. So they, they found that the Competition of Appeal Tribunal had not um, committed any error of law. So two very different sets of judgments, but very important judgments um, because they were um, interpreting the suitability requirement, so suitable to be included um, in, uh, uh, to, to go forward as collective of proceedings, which is really likely, I think, going forward to be the main issue that arises in most of these in most of these cases. And the interpretation of Lord Briggs and the majority, which is that this is a relative comparative exercise, um, certainly does open the door to more claims being brought. Now, that, that's all I want to say about, uh, by way of summary of the main points in the judgment. And I'm going to hand over to Tori now, who's going to think about, or who's going to tell you about the, the consequences and the ramifications. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marie. Before I get going, I might just say that at the end of my talk, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask any questions, which you may have. And there is, I think, something called a question box, which you should see, and you can type your questions into that, and then they'll come through to us. So as Marie said, 
I'm going to outline, outline some possible consequences of the judgment on other collective proceedings. I'd like to make seven points. So I'll start with a pretty obvious one. Um, there'll be, I think, more applications for summary judgment and for strikeout. So why do I say that? Firstly, as Marie just said, when Lord Briggs says that the certification process is not about and does not involve a merits test, he says that that is subject to two exceptions. The first of those exceptions is the power of the cat to strike out or give summary judgment on a claim. So that's a clear highlighting of that route through to a merits assessment. Secondly, the surmounting of those thresholds forms an important part of Lord Briggs's reasoning. So when he talks about a claimant's entitlement to a trial, it's on the basis that the claimant has an arguable claim. And thirdly, as Marie said, as far as timing of the applications is concerned, and as Lord Briggs notes, the rules provide that the CAP may hear any such applications at the same time as the application for a CPO. Clearly then, it's to be expected that in future cases, respondents to an application for a CPO will be more inclined to bring applications for summary judgment or for strikeout, whether in respect of the entirety of the proceedings or just parts of them as part of the CPO process. The second point, is that I would anticipate that there may be more focus on revisiting certification. So the primary legislation provides that the tribunal may vary or revoke a CPO at any time. Although that power did not occupy a central role in Lord Briggs's reasoning, he does refer to it. And going back to the Court of Appeal judgment, they did place some weight on that power and Lord Sales and Lord Leggett criticised them for having done so. Now, my view is that it is to be expected now that there will be a form of rolling vigilance on the part of respondents. In particular, as any set of proceedings progresses, it's to be anticipated, I think, that the continued fulfilment of the requirements for certification will be kept under scrutiny. And by the same token, it's to be expected that there may well be applications, more than one perhaps, to vary or revoke the CPO in the lifetime of the claim. The third point is a point which in my notes I've referred to as back to basics. So Lord Briggs construes the regime against the background of the common law and of general civil procedure. In particular, he looks at the principles which should apply to a court when considering a claim for damages brought individually. That assessment is then the point of departure for his relative suitability assessment. And this reflects his view that the collective process should not be taken to impose restrictions upon claimants as a class, which the law and rules of procedure for individual claims would not impose. Now, in Merricks, as Marie has said, the relevant common law and procedural authorities relate to assessment of damages where there are evidential difficulties. And after a survey of the authorities, Lord Briggs says that the court should not throw up its hands and in instead, essentially, that it has to do the best it can. And he says that the cat's failure to appreciate this legal principle was the most serious error of law which it committed. But it is to be anticipated, I would think, that this same approach, namely going back to basic principles of the common law and of civil procedure, will be picked up on in other cases and in respect of other elements of the claims. So that opens the door, I would think, for some really interesting and innovative legal argument. The fourth point, Canadian jurisprudence. So as well as looking at the English common law and civil procedure, Lord Briggs confirms that the Canadian jurisprudence is persuasive in our regime. This will of course be picked up on by both sides, claimant and respondent alike. And I think it's entirely to be expected now that parties will look to Canada for assistance when addressing untested aspects of our regime. So again, the door is open for interesting and innovative legal argument. The fifth point, what about evidence for the CPO application and at the CPO hearing? So of course, the focus of Merricks was on the availability of data in respect of pass on to consumers. I'm not going to address that in more detail given the live nature of that dispute. But one issue which I can safely address now relates to expert evidence at the CPO hearing. 
Lord Briggs disagreed with us and with the Court of Appeal when we said that the questioning and cross-examination of the experts had gone too far at the CPO hearing. He held that that questioning had been appropriate in the circumstances of the Merrick's case. However, he indicated that such an approach would be a rare occurrence and would be exceptional. So who decides? Well, of course, the tribunal can indicate that it would like to question the experts. But what approach should the respondents take? And I note in this regard that Lord Briggs held that questioning and cross-examination of the experts in Merrick's achieved a considerable improvement in the evidence. So in fact, in his view, that process operated to the class representative's benefit. So that issue, in essence, conduct of the hearing and who benefits from which approach is, is one which, in my view, is likely to require and repay some detailed strategic consideration. Sixth point, carriage dispute. So this is a bit of an odd one because all I can really do is flag it as an issue. I am instructed by Phil Evans in his application for a CPO in respect of the FX infringements. As many of you will know, there's a competing application for a CPO brought on behalf of Michael O'Higgins. So where there are two or more competing applications, the CAT needs to decide which, if either, goes forward. That decision is referred to in Canada as a carriage dispute, and that's the terminology which has come to be applied here. In Canada, a carriage dispute is heard as an, at an early preliminary stage far in advance of the CPO hearing. Now, we had a hearing in the FX claims before the CAT earlier this year to determine the timing of the carriage dispute here. And the CAT ruled that it should be addressed, at least in this case, as part of the CPO hearing itself. Um, so one question is what impact, if any, Merrick's has on the test to be applied in a carriage dispute? Since I'm instructed, instructed in FX, although I can pose the question, I'm afraid I'm not going to say anything about how the question should be resolved. The seventh point, my final point, the impact outside the CAT regime and more broadly. I am instructed by Richard Lloyd in his representative action under CPR 19.6 against Google. As many of you will know, we won in the Court of Appeal in respect of issues which are broadly equivalent to certification. And Google's appeal is due to be heard in the Supreme Court in April, April 2021, next April. In a sense, it's natural that there is something of a compare and contrast between those two different regimes. So one difference, for example, which is stark, is the test for commonality. In the CAT regime, that test is that the issues are same, similar or related. Whereas in the 19.6 regime, the class members must all have the same interest in the claim. So a narrower and more stringent test. In contrast, one similarity between the two regimes is the policy objective, namely providing a viable route to the court. Now, one sees in the judgment of the Court of Appeal in Lloyd and Google a clear recognition that if that representative action does not proceed, there will be no other remedy. Individual claims are not realistic and it really is the only show in town. Now, that has obvious resonance with Lord Briggs's judgment, which summarises the CAT regime as serving the statutory purpose of providing effective access to justice for claimants for whom the pursuit of individual claims would be impracticable or disproportionate. That's the point that Marie made. So in as much as there is read across between the two regimes and subject to what happens in the Supreme Court to Lloyd and Google, by way of general concluding remark, I would say that there is an observable opening up of means of collective redress in our courts and tribunals. There may be a host of different views as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But certainly it will mean, I think, that this is a more attractive jurisdiction in which these claims can be brought and therefore in which these claims can be defended. And the bringing of more such claims is, I think, the most obvious consequence of the Supreme Court's judgment in Merrick's. Now, that's all I wanted to say. I think we may have no questions coming through. The, the question box is empty which may mean that everyone can go and have a mulled wine or do a little bit more work before a mulled wine. Thank you all for attending. Um, and I hope you have a very nice Christmas. Thank you very much, everyone.